Good morning, uh, or strictly good afternoon. My name is Roger Kirby. I am the president-elect of the Royal Society of Medicine and welcome to COVID uh, webinar uh, number eight. We at the uh, RSM have been trying our best to uh, keep you, RSM members, and uh, indeed other healthcare professionals, uh, up to date with the very latest uh, developments uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'd like to remind you that there is a um, question uh, option here. We get very many questions in, so it's hard to answer uh, very many of them, but if you can use the upvoting uh, component, that really helps uh, us choose which questions we should put. To Professor Charles Knight, we're very lucky to have uh, him here today. He doesn't do many uh, interviews because he's busy running the uh, uh, amazing uh, Nightingale Hospital in the, the east of London, which is based in the Excel Centre. So I'll start off by uh, asking uh, Charles. Charles, tell us about how this amazing enterprise was set up, this response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Tell us uh, the background to this uh, organisation. Thanks very much, Roger, and, and thanks uh, so much for, for inviting me to, to this uh, webinar, webinar. I think one of the themes that will come out is how we've constantly had to react to fairly different, uh, profoundly different modelling and needs at various stages of, of this pandemic. Um, and uh, this story it really only started about five weeks ago, although it does seem uh, like another lifetime ago when London was progressively asked for more and more ITU capacity because the modeling was telling us we needed more and more ITU beds. So an initial ask went out to double ITU capacity, then to quadruple ITU capacity. And then I think it was the 23rd of, May, of March, uh, there, was, there was indications from the modeling that much more than that uh, would be required. Uh, so normally London has 799 ITU beds, someone obviously didn't quite have the courage to push it to 800. Um, and we were being, we were facing a need for 7,500 intensive care unit beds in London. Uh, at which point a number of, of, uh, of systems which had been looking at individual areas um, in terms of putting in a Nightingale type facility, uh, came together because the Excel Center, if one is talking about that level of patients, that number of patients was pretty much the only option in London. So there was a very clear commission for a very large center and a very large center that took ventilated patients. And obviously as time has gone on, and thank goodness, those numbers of patients were not required. Uh, so when we first came here, and we looked at these vast halls and we saw the beginnings of the bed bays being rolled out. It was a profoundly moving and really awe-inspiring and horrific moment because if you imagined all those bed beds being full of patients, it was like the apocalypse. So you have never, the sense of scale was unimaginable. And it is absolutely wonderful that that hasn't happened. Um, but that was our initial commission, and that's why we ended up here. So 23rd of March was the beginning, official opening of a hospital on the th uh, 3rd of April, and the first patients in on the 7th of April. So a remarkably short period of time from, from conception to the first patient being in. Uh, a huge input from the military, who were amazing, huge amounts of support, and uh, an amazing bunch of clinicians coming together uh, to, to make this happen at pace. Uh, so really, really very inspiring how people managed to, to get on and do that so quickly. Fantastic. Uh, I, there was an article in the Financial Times weekend saying that um, the fact that the NHS has been able to achieve this uh, in such a short space of time is uh, indicative of a way the, that the NHS might develop in the future to be more fleet of foot uh, than it has been. Do you think this, that's uh, a valid point? 
Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I think we were described in another newspaper as a lumbering bureaucracy. Uh, I think we have proven for once and for all that that's not the case. I don't think there's many private sector companies uh, that could have or indeed have responded um, to the pressures of COVID in the way we did. Uh, I don't think uh, Ocado has quite got its deliveries sorted out as quickly as we sorted out um, the Nightingale. So I'm very proud of that. I think everyone here and more widely in the NHS are all saying we can never go back to how we used to work. Um, and we don't want to do that. Now, there are uh, two important things to say. One is that the Nightingales are just one manifestation of that, but actually back at base, back at all of our base hospitals, amazing efforts have been made to reconfigure care, reconfigure intensive care unit beds, vastly increase capacity. Um, so, so the Nightingales are just one bit of it. The, 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 each NHS hospital and their staff have done amazing things to reconfigure. Um, secondly, one mustn't ignore the fact uh, that for most of one's time in the old NHS, you were talking about money uh, and a business case approval. Uh, and we haven't had to do that. Uh, but it would be foolish to think we could go back to a world where there is a blank checkbook. Uh, that's, that's not going to happen. But what we can do is to take pride in what's been achieved in terms of the flexibility of the response across the whole country, and also to learn from that to be more agile in the future and not go back to quite the sort of level of, uh, of bureaucracy that we used to deal with. Thank you, uh, Charles. <clears throat> There's some lots of questions coming in, about 17 so far. And Catherine Royce has said, would, would you ever have realistically have been able to staff uh, those, uh, I think 4,000 beds were talked of uh, initially. But th th and that also leads on to the question of the staff that you have have been redeployed and retrained. Could you tell us a little bit about how that's been achieved? So, the workforce, uh, it's very easy to build a new, well, it's not very easy, it's much easier to build a new hospital than to staff it. I think the honest answer is that it would have been really very, very, very difficult to staff all those thousands of beds. But we were faced with a situation where the, the, our people were either going to die because of a lack of a ventilator or we had to do something. And I think we would have had to have found a way we would have had to stretch staff, uh, skilled staff, supporting them with less skilled staff in a way to try and make that work because the, uh, the alternative was unthinkable. And I'll again reiterate how very grateful we are to Londoners who've shown really good compliance. Uh, all, the, all the curves suggest that the lockdown has been well managed and, and we are on a good compliance curve as it's called. In other words, the cases are following the best case scenario rather than the worst case. Uh, so enormously grateful to them and enormously grateful to the hospitals who've stepped up and increased their ITU capacity. So we weren't faced with those thousands of patients and we were, haven't been faced with the scenes that were seen in Lombardy of, of patients on oxygen in corridors. So I think London can take a lot of pride in that. Um, in terms of, of the staffing model, the thing that the Nightingale does is it provides a geographic difference, and that is obviously why it was called the Nightingale, because of the Nightingale-style wards with increased visibility, which is turning decades of intensive care medicine on its head, which have been all about side rooms uh, and one-to-one -one nursing. So the both the the makeup of our nursing training in terms of uh, not necessarily diminishing one-to-one -one nursing care, but in terms of diminishing the critical care to patient nursing ratio, so that we're currently working at a one-to-four with that, with a plan as we expand to get to one-to-six. Um, so the geography and the staffing model allows us to, as it were, stretch the skilled staff further than ordinarily they will be. Uh, and that model, and this is an important theme, I think, that, that model will, to some extent, forget about the actual ratios, that model will have to go back into normal intensive care unit practice for 
a period of time, because uh, I'll come on to in a minute that the idea of Nightingale as a bridge, but when intensifying unit capacity is permanently established in, in the normal hospitals, for a time at least, we will not be able to have the staff to staff those either. So the training offer here is very uh, positive. Um, we've already trained over 3,000 staff, and that's a mixture of, of essentially uh, fairly light training, a sort of induction process for, uh, for, for staff that know what they're doing. So a critical care nurse coming here just needs a bit of induction into how the nightingale is. On to taking people in from people that have never worked in healthcare before uh, so that they can support uh, the more skilled staff. And we've had some interesting groups like groups of, of uh, diving support people who are very used to gases and air. Uh, we've been training 20 of them to, to help the uh, anaesthetic technicians on the floor. So there's all sorts of models there. And although by definition all the Nightingale hospitals are temporary, we want a permanent training legacy which helps the NHS step up to the challenges that it will need because we all agree that we will need more beds, more ITU beds going forwards, and therefore we need more staff. So that permanent training legacy is probably the most important thing we can do here. Um, uh, and, and thank you for, for bringing that out. Well, and, and that's being done at the O2, isn't it? I spoke to Owen Deneen, a young uh, urology trainee, and he was wildly enthusiastic about it. It's always struck me that um, we tend to get segmented into one specialty, in my case, urology, and I do urology, re urology, urology. But I think what this illustrates is that doctors can be redeployed in the same way as maybe politicians get moved from uh, uh, ministry to ministry. Um, so uh, there's a question here from um, Ralph Graham and, and uh, also reiterated in many of the questions uh, before I came online. Um, Ralph Graham says, do you anticipate taking COVID patients into Nightingale from other hospitals so that they can become COVID free and return to normal activity? How do you see the future of Nightingale? Yeah. So um, we were set up for this immense surge and that has not played out. And that's amazingly good news. So we had a surge in, uh, in uh, intensive care unit usage and if you go if you remember that I said essentially 800 ITU beds in London uh, I think at peak we were about 1050 uh, COVID positive patients uh, in intensive care on top of probably another 250 or so uh, non-COVID patients who, who obviously need intensive care and that's an important theme. Uh, I think at the latest count we're in the mid 800s so if you look at it in that way, the total over the total number of usual ITU beds in London are still to this day full of COVID positive patients. Um, and there is an increasing need for London and the rest of the UK to get back to some degree of normal operating so that we are not losing patients from heart disease and cancer uh, and other important conditions that would usually get treated and the two reasons we haven't been able to do that are because our intensive care units are full of patients and also because the public has become very understandably very averse to going into hospital. Uh, and so there's increasing evidence that people are ign not ignoring, but uh, people are not uh, taking the notice they usually would of chest pain and then presenting very late with much bigger myocardial infarction. Or, or even uh, an increased risk of dying uh, at home from, from cardiac arrest. That has to stop. So what the Nightingale can offer is two models uh, going forward. One is, if you like, that of, of passive support, the insurance policy uh, for London, whereby we have a model that is worked out, tested, a building that works, uh, patients have been treated, um, we have all the operating procedures, everything in place, and, and we know that we can do this. And that 
that can be stood up and stood down at any point depending upon uh, whether and when there is a second peak um, and that might be the summer, it might be the autumn, it might be the winter. The second thing that the nightingale can do is to be a bridge to normal operation or, uh, or at least as normal as possible operation of the health service to allow non-COVID patients to be able to be treated. And it's quite clear that the health service, uh, regardless of the nightingales, will need to radically reorganize itself in order to provide some COVID-free hospitals or environments where, where patients are not at risk of infection and can have the confidence that they can get in and be treated and leave without contracting uh, the disease compared with other centers which will be COVID positive uh, hospitals. So the new infection control um, rules, which are not yet out and I'm just speculating, but I'm sure that they will include much more rigorous separation of COVID positive and COVID negative patient streams, zones, hospitals. So clearly in that phase, in that bridging phase, uh, the nightingale can be used to decant COVID positive uh, patients out of hospitals to allow some of them to, to, to be essentially COVID free. And that bridging function uh, is dependent upon us establishing what everyone thinks is the right strategy, which is that London must double its ITU capacity on a permanent basis going forward. And clearly, once that is done, and once we have plans for surge that are embedded within the hospital systems, that's where we should be focusing our intensive care efforts rather than an intensive care unit in a, in a conference center. So everyone's agreed that this must be a temporary phenomenon. And furthermore, that we must have a system of healthcare in this country that means if this ever happened again, that we wouldn't have to do this. We wouldn't have to build an intensive care unit in a, in a conference center because we had enough capacity under usual operating that we could cope with surge uh, uh, without having to do this. And furthermore, that, that we would be in a normal system where Lots of patients, as we all know, who get cancelled every year uh, for the lack of an ITU bed, that that doesn't happen. So there's a clear plan to double intensive care unit capacity on a permanent basis in London. And we can be the bridge to that if required. And we can also provide, if you like, the more passive insurance policy. We're here if you need us, Rob. Thank you, Charles. There's a question um, from Shirley Franklin, been upvoted 32 times. It's a little bit political. Why is there capacity in the Nightingale hospital beds when there are so many people dying of COVID-19 in care homes? Why, why don't you transfer the care home sick to, to a Nightingale hospital? So, uh, as I said, <clears throat> um, we are commissioned in a specific way, which is to take ventilated patients. Uh, and we take those patients that are given to us by hospitals. So the decision as to whether someone should be ventilated or should be uh, admitted to hospital has to be done in the usual manner. And if those patients are suitable for hospital admission and are suitable for ventilation, then we can take them here. Uh, once they've once they've been to their usual hospital, but we don't take patients direct here. That wouldn't be right, and we don't at the minute take uh, patients that are are conscious, other than those patients that are recovering from intensive care, because again the environment here is currently not set up for a a big step down facility, and because again that wasn't what we were set up to do. Other nightingales across the country have gone for a different model, which is much more about step down. Um, and that reflects the timing of when they were commissioned in terms of what the models were looking at at the time. Uh, so areas that came on a bit later than us might well have been looking at models that suggested that there wasn't an ITU super surge, if you like, but that there was a huge need for ordinary GNA beds. So they have accordingly set themselves up in different 
Thank you, Charles. Uh, I'm going to move now to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, a famous hospital that um, I used to work in for 10 years, some years ago, but um, you're CEO there, and some extraordinary things must have happened, not only at Bart's, but at UCL and right across London teaching hospitals. Just tell us a little bit about how you've coped with the surge of COVID patients there. So I think the first thing to say that there has been a genuinely amazing collaborative spirit between centres, which um, it won't be a huge surprise has, has not always been the case that uh, rival uh, major hospitals in London have not always seen eye to eye on everything. But uh, during this pandemic, I can genuinely say that there has been extraordinary collaboration. So, for example, uh, in the very early days of this, we, we saw a need to keep uh, emergency heart surgery going, say aortic dissection, people in need of very urgent valve replacement, very early bypass. And Steve Edmondson, who's uh, our uh, chief of surgery at St. Bartholomew's, has done an amazing job in creating a completely COVID free environment where those urgent operations can occur. Uh, and so far, uh, since this began, they've done 100 patients and none has contracted COVID. Um, that has required an enormous amount of change and an enormous amount of pre-operation screening. So that's a, 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 sim a symptom questionnaire, um, two swabs at different periods of time and a CT scan of the chest to make sure there are no uh, infiltrates before you can come in and have a bypass because the international experience is that if you do a bypass on someone you think is okay but turns out to have COVID and they're then on a ventilator for a few days that they do extraordinarily badly. So, so that has shown, if you like, the, has proved the concept that you can have a green zone, uh, if you like, a, a COVID-free zone, even within a hospital that's treating uh, COVID positive patients and that sort of model I'm, I'm, I'm confident will be the way that we have to do major surgery in the future. At the same time as that was going on uh, up on the sixth floor of St Bartholomew's we, we uh, had a 16 bedded uh, intensive care unit geographically remote from the uh, first floor cardiothoracic intensive care unit and that has been vastly expanded to over 60 beds uh, to cope with COVID positive patients and, and some of the more extreme, uh, extremely ill patients who require uh, heart lung support with ECMO. Again, we've vastly expanded our, our, our cohort there. So different parts of the hospital have done different things. The cancer services have had to be completely reorganized because again, having uh, having COVID and being on chemotherapy is, is, is incredibly bad news. So we've had to rationalize treatment, streamline treatment, change where treatment is given. Uh, and it is worth remembering that this has all happened just within uh, six weeks. So the effort has been amazing. The other important change, as I'm sure everyone will know, is, is, the, is the very rapid move to telephone and video outpatients. I think that has to and will will be a prolonged and probably permanent feature of hospitals going forward. Uh, the hospital outpatient waiting room uh, is probably a thing of the past uh, and we shouldn't have it back. There's one, <clears throat> one specific question uh, for you, Charles, from Bernie Laban. He's an anaesthetist at uh, George's and he says, this, it's back to the Nightingale, there's mm -hmm. concern that the top-down air conditioning at the open plan Nightingale with its very, very high ceilings, can spread droplets with virus and infect staff and patients uh, in the sort of rest area uh, in between the wards. Uh, any thoughts or comments on that? So uh, the design of the Nightingale is, is, is very airtight. So rest areas are completely separate. Uh, we, we have an enormous building, so there's no need to bring everything together. That was a story, I think, in the Telegraph this morning. Um, and I think there will be, uh, I'm not the right person to say whether that's true or not, uh, in terms of the, I'm not an air conditioning or a, uh, or a viro virologist uh, expert. Uh, obviously here, every patient is COVID positive, so there's no risk to patients. Uh, and we're, we, we are 
obviously try to look after our staff with full PPE and uh, uh, everything as, as possible. Um, I think it's important to note that probably from what we've seen of the very tragic healthcare worker uh, deaths, um, that there hasn't been a big signal that that's from intensive care. Uh, uh, I don't, it has been slightly more random than that. So that comes back to the earlier point I was making that what we need to be doing is treating COVID positive patients all cohorted together with, uh, with staff that are wearing all the right equipment and COVID negative patients proven treated by COVID negative staff, cohorted and geographically distinct. The problem comes if they get mixed. Yeah. So you, you've got enough PPE, uh, obviously, there, have you? Like everywhere, it, yes, is the short answer. But do we have vast stocks that would give us comfort? No. So it has been a hand-to-mouth existence like every hospital in the NHS with people scrabbling around to get enough supplies to keep staff safe. Uh, I think there's a general feeling that this, that situation has significantly improved over the last few days, but we're not at a level of comfort where, where I have a huge cupboard full of the stuff that I can go and gloat over. Uh, it, it's a matter of, of, you know, of taking it each day as it comes, each week as it comes. Yeah, very good. The, um, what, what lessons have you learned? What, what would you do differently, Charles, over these five weeks? I bet you've been working pretty much uh, uh, like uh, uh, in, immensely hard. But if you could go back to the beginning of March when you set all this up, what would you do differently? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it comes back to the point I made at the start, is that this unprecedented time means that we've had to do uh, different things um, because of best intentions at the time. So, and that's very different from saying that if we were in, um, if we were now given a model of a peak of a thousand patients, we would do, do things differently to if you were given a model of a peak of 7,500 patients. What's important is to retain that agility to keep learning. And I think that that clinical model at the, at the Nightingale, where we have been able to learn very, very quickly from, uh, from events, that's the thing to take forward. Uh, because we've had to, do, normally you have a plan, it takes years to enact it, and then then we, uh, we uh, and then you, you, you achieve it. We, we, our plans change all the time, our situation change all the time. We have to learn to be more adaptable. I guess that's what I'd take away. So the title of this uh, session that uh, the Nightingale is an agile response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is an accurate description of what's actually happened? Yes, and I would say, as I, as I reiter reiterate, that it's not just the Nightingale, it's the NHS has been incredibly agile and adaptable. Well, I'm going to finish uh, off because it's very, very nearly uh, one o'clock. Charles, um, I I'll get into trouble if I don't give um, a plug for your other job, which is the heritage aspect of St. Bartholomew's Hospital. It's the oldest hospital in its original site in Europe, uh, and it's coming up to its 900th anniversary. So the question that comes from uh, Will Palin, that's Michael Palin's son, who's actually going to do an in-conversation uh, session with us on the 3rd of June. The question is, what are you going to do to mark uh, that ancient anniversary of 900 years at Barts? Yeah, it's a slightly strange position to be the uh, CEO of the oldest and the youngest hospital in, in, the, <laughs> in the UK. Um, it is an amazing opportunity. I mean, there are very few human endeavours that last 900 years, and we're immensely proud of that anniversary. And, and, and in 2023, we will be celebrating across the board, involving all sorts of alumni, current staff, patients, to make sure that we, we really celebrate this, um, this amazing anniversary. But more importantly, we want to leave a lasting legacy. We want to protect the past. So the, uh, the historic north wing of the hospital, which Will is, is now running, thank goodness, uh, is an amazing place. Come and visit once social distancing ends. Uh, but it has been 
neglected for, for good reasons because it's belonged to the NHS. You can't spend patient treatment income on, on regilding frescoes. Um, but it needs uh, large sums of money to get it up to up to scratch to 